Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's awesome to see so many people here. I honestly kind of sort of didn't believe that many people still read books in the world. Um, given our next speaker, it's possible just this many people read The New Yorker, but uh, I'm pretty excited. Normally, I like to actually read the book before I introduce the speaker. Unfortunately, I was in Southeast Asia for the 10 days. The book's kind of just out, uh, and I got it literally last night, um, and uh, I figured, okay, what the heck, I'll start. Um, and I made it through the first 200 pages or so, so it's uh, eminently readable. Um, it's really great. Um, I think um, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's been um, at The New Yorker since 1996. We certainly know him from Tipping Point, Blink, Outliers, uh, What the Dogs Saw. I know a lot of us have read his stuff. I'm really looking forward to uh, him uh, generating some interesting uh, conversation ideas. And please give a warm Microsoft welcome to Malcolm Gladwell. Thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here to see so many of you. Um, I can't remember how many times I've been uh, here to Microsoft, but it's, it's now many. Um, each time I come here, there's more and more campus. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm on my book tour. You start your book tour on the West Coast in LA, and you work your way north. And I don't know how many of you have had this experience, but you had the very distinct sense when you start in LA and then go to San Francisco and then Portland and Seattle that the kind of average IQ rises as you move <laughs> north. Um, but before, before, you, before you get too big headed, I would point out that I'm a Canadian and so my assumption. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so I am. Um, I thought in honor of, of uh, the fact that I, I'm in such a high IQ environment, I would talk about one of the nerdier ideas in, in my book, um, which is I have a, a couple of chapters, or one in particular, where I, um, I deal with the idea of the inverted U-shaped curve um, as an explanatory model for various kinds of social phenomena. And what interests me about um, inverted U-shaped curves is that they are, there is something about them that uh, defies uh, uh, intuitive comprehension. Um, so I'm sure you all know what an inverted U-shaped curve is. We know what linear curves are, right? Where there is a constant relationship between inputs and outputs. We're very comfortable with uh, diminishing marginal returns, curves that are, look like that, where things start to flatten out. But the inverted U is where things start positive, go flat, and then turn negative, right? And like I said, what interests me is that we have such a hard time with that concept. Linear curves are the easiest of all of us, for all of us to understand. Uh, diminishing marginal returns is also a concept that I think is not overly impossible for the general public to get. But inverted U-shaped curves defeat us every time. And one of, the, one of the things I try to do in the book is to illustrate why this is so uh, profoundly problematic. Um, the question I don't answer in the book, but which I hope to start a conversation about, is why that's the case. What is it about this kind of relationship that proves so difficult uh, for uh, human beings? Um, so let me give you two examples of U-shaped curves that I talk about in the book, and you'll see the kind of consequences of our problem with them in, in each case. Uh, the first is about um, California's experience with the three strikes law which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Um, this law has its origins 20 years ago when a man named Mike Reynolds, who lives in Fresno, California, has a 18-year-old daughter who is uh, tragically murdered by some drug-crazed guy on a motorcycle in downtown Fresno. And he embarks on a crusade um, to strengthen California's criminal laws because he believes his daughter's Murderer is only out on the streets because the 
criminal justice system in California is too lax. And he succeeds. Within a year, his crusade results in a proposition being passed, um, which dramatically strengthens the criminal laws in California. So that the, for any second offense, a criminal's uh, mandatory sentence was doubled under three strikes. And for a, a third offense, and a third offense was defined incredibly broadly, um, basically anything, including stealing a slice of pizza, for your third offense, you would go to jail for a minimum of 25 years and a maximum of life. And the result is that California enacts the toughest set of criminal statutes in the Western world. And over the course of the life of three strikes, remember it's famously, it's, it's, it's uh, repealed in part last year, but over the 20 year course of the, of the law, uh, the prison population in California doubles and the per capita prison population in California rises to seven times that of uh, Western Europe and Canada. So you had this extraordinary increase in criminal penalties. Um, now, I don't, I'm going to go into a little bit um, in a moment about criminology, but that's not really what interests me here. What interests me at the moment is the psychology of Mike Reynolds' response, right? He sees a system where he believes, a, a society where he believes crime is out of control, and his assumption is that if he increases the criminal, the penalties for criminal behavior by a certain amount, crime will decrease by a roughly equivalent amount. He has in his head, in other words, a notion of the relationship between uh, penalties and criminality as linear. That's what's in his head. And when he makes this argument to the people of California in this campaign to get uh, the three strikes law enacted, the, the, the law is enacted, the proposition is supported by an overwhelming majority of Californians in 1994. Why? Because that logic seems to them to be completely compelling. It makes sense. If you've got too much crime, uh, it must be the case that if you raise the penalties for crime, the crime rate will, um, will go down. Um, so what happens after three strikes is passed? Well, what people observe in the short term, in the mid-90s, is that the crime rates in California uh, start to come down uh, by an enormous amount. In the mid-1990s, uh, uh, murder, rape, robbery, um, uh, auto theft, I could go on, all fall by about 40 to 50 percent in the span of a couple of years. And the assumption people have is that that is a consequence of the three strikes law. But very quickly it becomes clear that it's not. Um, when people look closer at the numbers, they see that those crime declines started before three strikes was enacted. And then when they look around the United States, they realize that crime is falling by a similar amount in every state in the union, even in places where the criminal laws were uh, untouched. Right? So it becomes entirely unclear that this is a result of three strikes. And in the 20 years that three strikes was in effect, there were an enormous amount of studies of this in the criminal literature. Um, dozens and dozens of studies. And they could reach no consensus whatsoever on what the effect of the law was. So there were huge numbers of studies which said they found zero effect. There were a small number that said maybe it lowered crime by a little bit. And then there's a whole another series of, of, of studies that said, you know, we think actually crime in California is higher after three strikes than it would have been otherwise. In other words, we had this model in our heads about what the effect of raising criminal penalties would be, and the experience of three strikes defied the model. Right? If you look at what actually happened, you realize, oh, the model in our head wasn't the right, uh, wasn't, we, we weren't carrying around the right assumptions to explain what would happen to crime. Um, let me give you another example. Um, I don't know whether, I imagine that, in, I'm from New York, um, but I imagine that in Seattle, there is as much obsession among parents as there is in New York with the question of uh, class size, right? People are, when it comes to making, to evaluating the quality of education, one of the, if not one of the metrics, if not the leading metrics that many parents use is the average size of the classroom that their child will be a student in, right? And the assumption 
is that the smaller the class, the better off your child is. Now that assumption has been around for an extraordinarily long time. If you look at the project of public education over the last 100 years in this country, it has been, uh, the first thing you see is that the increase in the amount of money spent on public education over the last 100 years has been mind-blowing. We're talking about something that has exceeded the rate of inflation by several X. And if you look at where that money has gone, what you discover is that overwhelmingly that money has gone towards hiring additional teachers. That the project of public education over the last 100 years has been in steadily um, uh, making classes on average smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And the pace of that change has accelerated in recent years, not decelerated. So if you look at, for example, between 1996 and 2004, the average class in this country goes from, I think, 17.5 to 16.2 students. Now, that's, there's a complex methodology, but let's leave that aside. The point is that that sounds like a trivial decline. It's not. That in that eight-year span, that difference in class size means you, that we as a country hired an additional uh, 240,000 teachers. Right? And if you do the math on that, that's a lot of money. Um, there is almost no intervention you can do in public education that costs more than uh, reducing class size. It dwarfs everything else in terms of cost, which makes sense, right? You hire more teachers, you're, if you think about a teacher and their pension and their health care and all that stuff, you're talking $80,000, $90,000 a year, and then you've got to build classes to accommodate them. That's a lot of money at the end of the day. Um, and it's reflected in the taxes that you pay, right? And like I said, why? But there has been almost no um, argument over this project. In fact, there is no single intervention in the public education arena that, is, that has higher levels of public support than reducing class size. And why are we so much in favor of class size? Because we have this in our heads, right? We think, oh, if my kid is happy in a class of 25, they will be happier in a class of 20. So what does the evidence say? Well, it turns out that the evidence on class size looks an awful lot like the evidence on three strikes. It in no way does it support the notion that there's this kind of curve. In fact, the evidence on class size is one big unholy mess. Um, there are uh, a mountain of studies. When I say a mountain, I mean quite literally a mountain. I could fill this room with the studies that have been done on class size over the last um, hundred years, and they have they reach absolutely no consensus. Um, the perhaps the best, one of the best and most famous studies to give you a sense of how confusing this field is, uh, was done a couple years ago by an economist named Carolyn Hoxby. And she takes advantage of this really interesting natural experiment, which is um, present in the state of Connecticut. Connecticut is a state that has tons and tons and tons of very, very small school districts. So lots and lots of little schools. And if you think about um, little schools and little districts, they're going to have far more variable enrollments than large schools and large districts, right? And not only that, uh, Connecticut has this law which says that every class has to be capped at uh, 24 students. So what you see are these wild swings in the sizes of classes from year to year. One year you've got 48 kids and you have two classes of 24. One year you've got 49 kids and you have classes of 16, 16, and 17. With the same teachers in the same town, in the same school, with the same economy, with the same parents, with the same beautiful natural experiment. What you do is, you, what she does is she accumulates 30 years of data and she looks at all 650 elementary schools in the state of Connecticut and she just says, look, in those years where completely randomly there's 16 kids in a class or 17 or 18, how do the outcomes of those kids compare with the years in which there's 24? And what does she do after she accumulates this beautiful, enormous data set? What does she find in the difference between the performance of kids in the small classes with the performance of the kids in the large class? Zero, nothing, goose egg. And I say zero, I mean actually absolute zero. It's not a, it's not a, <laughs> I'm, I, she's not talking about something that's kind of, it's there, but it's not terribly statistically significant. She finds a statistically significant zero, <laughs> right? Now, if you look at the, uh, take the 300 best 
class sizes, some of them aren't very good, but you take the 300 best ones and you do a meta-analysis, you find basically the same thing. 15% um, of the studies on class size show a, uh, uh, a significant, although albeit very small effect from reducing classes. The balance, 85%, either shows zero or a negative effect from reducing class sizes. That is not a terribly overwhelming um, support um, for the notion that classes should be smaller. In other words, we have spent tens, if not hundreds of billions of your dollars, um, oh, also mine, by the way. I'm no longer a Canadian. I'm, I mean, I live here now, so it's my dollars too. We have all spent billions and billions of dollars over the last 25 years on this accelerated course of reducing class sizes, and there is absolutely no evidence to suggest that has made our kids better off. We've gone around with this model in our heads, and it's the wrong model, right? So what is the right model? Well, I think the right model here is the, right, is the same as the right model in the case of crime. We should be thinking about this, the inverted U. So let's go back and think about the inverted U for a moment. Um, an inverted U curve obviously has three components. There's the left side of the curve where the relationship between inputs and outputs is positive. There is the middle part of the curve where the relationship is neutral, right? And then there is the right side of the curve where the relationship is negative, where the, the, the process that we observe to be advantageous in the beginning turns, it turns into a process that is um, disadvantageous. Um, and what I would argue is that the U-shaped curve fits many more social phenomena in our society than we care to admit. Um, in fact, it is the most powerful way, of intuitive way of making sense of the kinds of things that we are interested in as a society. Um, so if you fit the U-shaped curve to the question of class size, it works perfectly. You divide up the studies that are out there on class size according to the sizes of the class that they're dealing with, and all of a sudden you see, oh, right, now this works. So if we start with the very, very large classes, uh, 45 kids, and we reduce them to 30, are the kids better off? You bet they're better off, right? It's a famous study done um, in Israel because Israel had very, very large class sizes and began to reduce them. And what did they observe? The kids are better off in a class of 30 than they are in a class of 45. Of course they are. 45 is crazy. 45, all the teacher is doing is try to keep order, right? They're a traffic cop. That's it. They're not giving anyone any kind of individualized attention. They can't even remember the names of the kids in their class, for goodness sake, right? You go to 30, everything changes. And so we do see, by the way, the effect sizes between 45 and 30 are not huge, but they are significant. We're absolutely better off in that situation. Then what happens? Well, you get into the 20s, and it's pretty clear that you're in the flat middle part of the curve. You can't see huge differences between 26 and 22, or 25 and 20. They're just not there. And when that Carolyn Hoxby study I told you about in Connecticut, that's a lot of what she's getting at. Most of the effect sizes she was looking at was comparing were in that low to mid-20 range, and they're there's just no, uh, no evidence that it makes one bit of difference whether you're in a class of 24 or 21. Why is that? Well, part of it has to do, we think, with the fact that um, uh, one of the principal assumptions behind our belief in the efficacy of smaller classes is uh, untested and may actually be wrong. Um, for it to work that a small class is better, the teacher's behavior would have to change as the class got smaller. And it's not clear that it does. So for example, um, if I were to cut the workload of everyone in this room by 25%, one of two things could happen. <laughs> you, could, <laughs> you could either work the same number of hours, but just spend an awful lot more time on the remaining 75%, or you could go home early. Right? Now, I'm not saying that this group would necessarily choose option one, but our, or option two, but our observation, <laughs> sorry, option, but our observation of teachers is, as a group, they choose option two. You cut the size of their class, they just work less hard, right? That's kind of human nature. 
The most interesting, though, suggestion in the literature is that when you get below 20, uh, you are very clearly on the right side of the curve, that things are getting worse, not better. And the most, I will give the caveat that there are not a lot of, bizarrely, not a lot of studies on very, very small classes. Um, but those that have been done um, uh, often show or have shown a negative effect. And the reasoning is as follows. Uh, it's principally focused not on the bright kids, but on the struggling kids. Bright kids, by the way, no one should ever study uh, bright kids in <laughs> educational policy. It's crazy. If you're smart, you're fine. You, you can, if you've got a bright kid, you can lock him in a closet and they'll be fine. We shouldn't, we shouldn't waste our time as a society worrying about the educational outcomes of kids with IQs of 130, please. But the issue is with, with struggling kids. Um, and the argument is as follows, that the single, one of the single most important determinants of success in a classroom for someone who is struggling is the presence of a, a, a real peer. That is to say, someone who is struggling at the same rate as you, who is asking the same questions, having the same problems, and worrying about the same things. And that if you have a true peer in the class, you don't feel as isolated and as marginal. You don't feel as dumb. And the class slows down a lot, right? The more of you there are having the same problems, the more the level of teaching is going to slow down and address your concerns. So what happens when classes get too small is that it becomes harder and harder for the struggling students to find true peers. Um, and so the argument is we're really hurting. We're so focused, by the way, on the relationship between the student and the teacher that we forget that for students, a far more, relationship, more important relationship is between them and their peers. And as you take away peers from struggling students, you harm them. That's the argument, right? I was so fascinated by this that I, when I was doing my book, I went and I, uh, I did an informal survey of several hundred um, teachers. Um, and the, fascinating, the second fascinating thing about educational research is if you really want to know the answer to a thorny educational problem, you just have to ask teachers. No one ever asked teachers. It's fascinating to me. You can read. I've read you know, many, many educational studies in my time. It astonishes me how infrequently um, researchers simply don't just ask teachers for their perspective on a problem. Anyway, so I, I did this big survey of teachers. And I said, I asked the question, is there such, thing, uh, such a thing as an optimal class size? Right? Is there a point at which a class could be too small? Not everyone, but nearly everyone writes back, of course. Absolutely, there's a point where it can be too small. Now, there was some variation in what people thought the optimal size was, but it was a surprisingly narrow window. Most people seem to think that when you got too far below 20, things got problematic. Um, and they gave a couple of additional arguments. In addition to the poor students being stranded argument, uh, one argument I heard a lot was that um, behavioral problems in very small classes can be really overwhelming. Because as one teacher said, it's like driving cross country with two squabbling children in the back seat. When a class gets too small, one problematic dynamic between two kids dominates the whole class. They can't hide from each other, right? You, and it can be so disruptive because they're just on the side of the throats. The other more important argument was that uh, you can't get discussion going, particularly as kids get a little bit older. When you start to get into young adolescence, and kids start to, students start to get very self-conscious and um, don't like the spotlight being shined on them. Um, and you want to have, you know, the hallmark of a successful educational experience is a diverse amount of discussion in the class, right? All the great teachers, that's what they do. They get a discussion going. Because again, kids learn as much, if not more, from their peers horizontally as they do from their teacher vertically. Well, too few voices in the class means that the discussion suffers. There's just not enough viewpoints, not enough experiences. And the kids are feeling very, very um, uh, uh, scrutinized in a small class. And you have these. And all these teachers would tell me these stories about the time I had 14 kids. It was a nightmare, right? You just could not get any kind of life going. And the class wasn't, wasn't exciting, right? The, um, <clears throat> so what we see then is a clear case 
where the uh, model that we should be using to evaluating this most crucial of interventions um, is wrong. We've been doing this. We should be thinking about this. And that would change the way we approach all kinds of different questions um, in, in, in education. Um, very, very parenthetically, um, I don't know how many of you send your kids to a private school, but the chief offenders on this front are private schools who go around boasting about how small their classes are, right? Without any regard to the notion that they, this may actually be a way in which they're harming their students. Why do private schools do this? Because their principal motivation is not to provide the best learning environment for students. It is to provide um, the most dazzling presentation to parents, right? They're interested in you, not the kids, which um, is not all that surprising. Um, <laughs> so crime, if we go back to crime, how well does the U-shaped curve fit our understanding of the relationship between criminal penalties and the crime rate? And the answer is, uh, it fits it pretty well. Um, so if you think about our curve with our left side, our middle, and our right side, is there a left side where we see clear benefits in terms of reduced crime from raising penalties? Absolutely. If you have zero penalties and you raise them to X, crime is going to fall, right? Um, there's a great example everyone always uses is the famous police strike in Montreal in 1970. For 19 hours, the police go on strike in Montreal. And in those 19 hours, Montreal basically turns into a medieval city. Uh, <laughs> There are gun battles in the streets. There are, uh, uh, the bank, there's so many banks are robbed that the banks just shut down. They just like shut the doors and the whole city sort of comes to a halt. This is Canada, right? <laughs> and I don't even know people had guns in Canada, but they somehow <laughs> discover them in that 19 hour period, just go around shooting people, right? Absolutely, there's a left side to this curve. Is there a middle where uh, the introduction of harsher penalties has no effect on crime. Absolutely. Um, a great example of this is with uh, three strikes. Um, and this is a point, by the way, this is one of those arguments. I have tried to make this argument to, let's just say, less sophisticated audiences. People refuse to believe this argument. So I'm just going to say. They refuse. I don't know why. This is really hard for people to grasp. But OK, here's how it goes. You won't have any problem with this. Um, <laughs> Under the three strikes law, the average age in which someone was convicted of their three, third strike was 37 years of age. Before three strikes, that person would have served an average of five years for their felony conviction. So they would have gone to jail from 30, the age of 37 to the age of 42 and gotten out. Under three strikes, they went to jail essentially for life. So they went to jail at 37 till the end of their days. So what three strikes had the effect of doing was locking up that person between the age of 47 and the end of their life, right? So the question is, how many crimes do criminals typically uh, commit after the age of 42? And the answer is none. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> you see, ever look at, at, cur at, at um, age crime curves, they are the most Fascinating thing you've ever seen. The age crime curve looks like this. <laughs> no one commits, I mean, I say no one. Statistically, crimes stop being committed past the age of, basically by the end of your 20s, your criminal career is largely over, with some exceptions. <laughs> um, so there are a few people in this room who I still think are at risk for doing something nasty. <laughs> Most of you, you're out of the woods, right? <laughs> So what does three strikes do? You think you're doing this enormously important thing by locking these people up from 42 till the end of their days. But in fact, you have intervened in the career of the lifespan of a criminal at precisely the moment that he has stopped committing crimes. Right? That's the middle part of the curve. Now, here's the really interesting part, though. Is there a right side to the curve? Is there a point at which locking up more and more people raises crime rates? And this is where the argument gets really interesting. Um, so there's a whole school of criminologists in recent years who have said, who've started to make this argument. And the argument goes something like this. When you lock up somebody, there is a direct and an indirect effect on crime. 
The direct effect on crime is easy to understand. That individual, by virtue of being behind bars, can no longer commit a crime, right? The indirect effect is on the community that individual is a part of. So they are criminals. Even juvenile delinquents are statistically um, more than likely, more likely than not to be parents. I don't know if you knew this. The actual number is kind of fascinating. Hold on, I have it here. One fourth, oh, I'm sorry. One, it's only one, one fourth of juveniles convicted of crimes have children. Um, and the effect of, on a child of having a father put behind bars is actually quite devastating. It's, we have the numbers, people have done this. It raises your chance of being a juvenile delinquent by something like 300%. It raises your chance of suffering from clinical depression by something like 200%. Um, there are these collateral consequences, in other words, to locking up someone. Most criminals are breadwinners. Even though they may not be getting their money legitimately, that's still, <laughs> that's still money that's going to feed and clothe their family. When you remove someone from a society, from a community, you remove a breadwinner, right? When you remove the biggest thing that keeps, the biggest predictor of, uh, of a productive life for someone in a poor community is whether their parents are married. There is nothing more devastating to a marriage than being locked up. It, it destroys marriages. Um, uh, and then, most importantly, the person that you lock up invariably returns to that community after they've served their term. And when they return, they are in far worse shape than when they left, right? They've just been behind bars for X number of years. They're unemployable. Their peer group has now been replaced with a entirely criminal peer group. And they are a burden on their family. So those are all of the collateral consequences of imprisonment. Normally, the direct effects under most situations, circumstances, the direct effect of locking someone up is greater than the indirect collateral damage caused by them being locked up, except if you lock up too many people. Then the collateral effect starts to outweigh the direct effect. Now, what is the threshold? Well, we think, based on some very preliminary research, that the uh, that the, the tipping point, if you like, is uh, <laughs> it's right around 2%. If I lock up 2% of a community, collateral damage starts to be greater than uh, direct damage. Now, 2% does not sound like a high number. It's an enormous number. Um, nonetheless, are there communities in the United States where more than 2% of the adult population is behind bars? Absolutely. Right? In fact, there are communities that are well above that 2% mark. And studies of those kinds of communities have suggested that the more people from those communities are locked up, the worse the crime problem in those universities, in those uh, communities. Universities? <laughs> Sorry, I've been on the road for a long time. Um, <laughs> communities becomes. Um, so the question is, when was the last time you heard a politician, if this is true, stand up and say, in answer to pleas from their constituents to do something about the crime problem, to stand up and say, okay, I will. I'll start letting people out of jail. It doesn't happen, even though that is an entirely logical response given these curves. In fact, if you look, the most fascinating example of this is this is exactly what happened in New York City. I don't know if you know this, but New York City and a crime in New York City declined in the 1990s um, somewhat in lockstep, actually a little bit ahead, of criminal declines, of crime declines in all other major urban areas in the United States. And then in the turn of this century, the crime rates in most American cities plateaued, um, and in some cases crept up again, like Chicago. In New York, they continued to fall. In fact, New York is now this, such a completely bizarre, inexplicable outlier in the world of crime that nobody knows what to do. It's blown apart every assumption. New York. It just, crime just keeps getting lower and lower and lower and lower. On certain industries, if you just, if you take out, it's gonna sound dumb, but if you remove murder from the equation, <laughs> uh, New York is basically safer than Tokyo right now, which is so weird and bizarre, it doesn't make any sense. But the fascinating thing about this crime decline in New York, the second crazy crime decline, is that it has been occurring as the criminal population um, of uh, New York City um, has been in sharp decline. In other words, it's happened while we've been emptying the prisons, right? Exactly what the U-shaped curve would suggest, that New York, 
was in many communities past the 2% cutoff point. And what, they're, what they've been doing over the last 10 years is bringing that uh, imprisonment rate back below that crucial uh, threshold. And in so doing, restoring the community, even as they are um, uh, letting more criminals out uh, behind bars. But no one makes that argument. It's completely implausible, right? You can't ima can you imagine a politician standing up and saying that? And why not? Because we have such difficulty with this notion of a U-shaped curve. Because it seems to be beyond the ability of anyone in this country to stand up and say, it's not this. It's this. Now, why can't we grasp this? Why, what is so hard about this? Well, that's why I don't have a good answer. And I would actually, we don't have time for questions. I'd love to hear people's suggestions. I'm going to throw out a couple of uh, very, very speculative, um, not terribly serious um, uh, um, possible answers. Um, the first one, which I don't really buy, some people would say, well, it's just this is hard. Right? That's easy to explain. This is hard to explain. I don't think this is hard to explain at all, actually. It's what your mom said, everything in moderation. Right? <laughs> What's hard about that? Nothing's hard about that. So I don't really buy the it's hard argument. You could make a kind of, this is again, this is a very whimsical suggestion. Uh, could you make an evolutionary psych argument that says that we, because we evolved in times of profound material scarcity, there is nothing in our hardware that accepts the notion of too much, right? It would have never been an advantage during much of human evolution for us to ever conceive of something being problematic in excess, because there was no excess. It's only in the last 100 years that we've invented this notion of surplus, that we've had enough money to be able to, to make classes too small, or had enough resources to be able to lock up too many people. And maybe that's just a new phenomenon for us that we haven't grappled with. That's one idea. Um, but what is interesting about all of this is that uh, the key component that unites both the crime and the educational examples is that they are both cases uh, where in order to see, to grasp the nature of the U-shaped curve, you have to look beyond the individual, right? If all you do is think about a student standing by him or herself, a student in isolation, you can't see the problem with classes being too small. You have to understand that the student is part of an ecosystem in the classroom and is dependent on their peers. And so you take away too many of the peers, the dynamics become problematic. Same thing with criminality. In order to understand the problem with locking up the criminal who's in front of you, you have to understand that the criminal isn't, doesn't act in isolation, that they have families and they come from neighborhoods. And in some bizarre and paradoxical way, their families and neighborhoods depend on them. And if you target too many people like that, you're harming everyone who's still at home. In both cases, in other words, it requires us um, to have not just a different kind of of mental model, of mathematical model, it requires us to have a different kind of social model. It requires us to understand that human beings don't stand alone in the world. They're part of larger groups. So, thank you. Um, I think. I'd love to take questions. Let me just put my glasses on so I can see you. Um, there's one in the front. Have oh. you applied your theory to DC politics? Do, do, do I find it? Have you applied your theory to DC politics? Oh, the question is, have I applied this theory to DC politics? Um, <laughs> no. Uh, I, uh, I always give this answer on, uh, I, as a Canadian, I have no understanding of American politics. And <laughs> the longer I spend in this country, the less understanding I have of what goes on. Um, but, um, but certainly, the, I, I mean, you know, if, if the lesson of all, everything I just told you is what your mother told you a long time ago, that everything in moderation, that certainly is something that could be, um, is worth uh, saying in Washington right now. Um, sure. Sure. stock market is going up, people assume it's going to keep going up. And if it's going down, they assume it's going to keep going down. They can't even recognize a simple you know, pattern. Yeah. So this is like impossible because it goes up and down at the same time. 
This, so yeah, this is a very, a question, I don't, I'm going to repeat the question because I'm not sure all of you heard it. It's actually, a, it raises a really interesting point. So the questioner said, um, uh, made an analogy to the stock market that people even have difficulty in the stock market in understanding that just because it's going up now doesn't mean it'll always go up, right? They, they're, they, every, there is some part of us that wants to extrapolate indefinitely from that kind of upward momentum. Um, what's fascinating about that is that that is absolutely true. But in recent years, there's been a lot of work to suggest that that is um, true specifically of Western um, cultures. There are clear differences between in the kind of bedrock mental assumptions or cultural assumptions um, held by people in the East and people in the West. Um, and so uh, when you, so for the longest time, psychologists would make that observation, but they were doing all their studies in Western Europe and North America. And the minute they started to do those studies in China or Japan or Korea, they discovered that people didn't um, lock in to those kinds of, uh, of, of relatively simplistic relationships. Um, so it is a, it may be something weirdly specific to the kind of analytical package that, the, that uh, people carry around in the West. Um, certainly, by the way, on the, this just occurs to me. Um, if you go to countries like Korea, the, it, for example, the classes are really large compared to American uh, classes. No one seems to assume that the kids would benefit from a dramatically smaller classroom. Um, so it's, and by the way, their students dramatically outperform ours in addition. Um, so, sure. Hello. So um, in one of your interviews, I remember you saying that uh, having too much money can be a little problematic. So I'm just wondering if uh, personal wealth follows the same um, yeah, great curve. question. Yeah, does personal wealth follow an inverted U-shaped curve? And the answer is, uh, I have a chapter on this. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, but the, the, the way to answer, the, the, the most specific way to say it is that parenting clearly is U-shaped. Um, it is very hard to be a parent if you have very little money. And as I give you more money, your job as a parent gets easier. Absolutely. Does it, is there a middle part of the curve where that effect starts to level off? Yes. Um, we, we can argue about what the number is, but you know, most of the happiness research says that around $75,000 or $80,000 a year, you stop seeing monotonic increases in happiness associated with wealth. Um, then is there a right side? And so I, I hung out. You, you guys will be very intrigued by these observations. I hung out when I was writing my book with all of these children of very, very wealthy people. And in order to see whether the kind of thing, you know, we all of us have a cliche in our head about the spoiled rich kid, right, who doesn't, can't make. And if you talk to people who do counseling of wealthy kids, and there's, a, by the way, an entire ecosystem of psychologists <laughs> who do nothing but do this, and they will say, well, that's absolutely the case. You would not believe the level of dysfunction among wealthy kids. So I began to interview lots and lots of wealthy kids. And I have to say, whoa. Um, <laughs> and you realize that what's going on is that exactly what I said, which is that um, the task of being an effective parent begins to get harder again when resources pass a certain threshold amount. For the, and it's not impossible to be a good parent if you're wealthy. It's just harder. Um, harder in the way that it's hard to be a good parent if you have too little money. And the classic example, this guy James Grubman gave me this beautiful way of phrasing it. He said, you get into these can't, won't problems. That if you are a middle income parent and your child says, I'd like a pony, you say, we can't. And the kid very quickly understands there's a whole range of requests they can make that will never, ever be granted. They're just impossible, right? You're not getting a pony. I mean, you don't have to say it anymore. You just have to say, well, it's not happening, right? If you have $100 million and your kid says, I want a pony, you can't say, we can't have a pony. You've got a private jet. Of course I can have a pony, right? <laughs> so now, if you don't want your kid to have a pony, you have to be capable of making not a can't argument, but a won't argument. And a won't argument is a lot harder. A won't argument requires that you say, Explain what your values are and explain what your attitude toward, as a parent is towards your child and explain why this paradox, which is why providing for your every needs now at the age of 10 is not in your own best long-term interest, right? That's a much harder 
conversation to make, particularly if you're guilty about working 80 hours a week, right? So it gets harder again. And that's, I think, what's going on with um, this consistent phenomenon of, um, of second and third generations of wealth um, falling apart, which is their parents aren't prepared for the additional responsibility of being rich. Um, so absolutely, there's a U-shaped curve. Um, sure. Is uh, the inverted U uh, model okay, well, just an opposition in terms, in the sense of, uh, in software, we, we look at, uh, for example, getting to 99% no bugs, 99% cost or whatever, um, as diminishing returns. So if you invest 90% in the last 10%, would it actually apply here in terms of becoming an inverted Yeah. Man? Yeah, so the question is, does this uh, apply in, in sort of, uh, is this a natural extension of diminishing returns? In other words, that do you always, if you keep adding resources during the period of diminishing returns, do things eventually always go negative? Um, really interesting thought. Um, I don't know. I mean, this is a kind of, it's the most fun kind of question to ask because it's ultimately unanswerable. Um, <laughs> but um, I kind of think so. So a good thought experiment is, Give me, a, give me an example of a phenomenon involving human beings um, that is not U-shaped. In other words, can you come up with a phenomenon involving human beings that is purely linear or purely just diminishing marginal returns? And the answer is, I, I've given this question to lots and lots of people. No one's ever given me a good one. Where does it, you know, even, even just simply ending at diminishing marginal returns, can you think of that? If I... If I were to take the R&D budget of any company in the United States and increase it by a factor of 10x, do we, does anyone really think that wouldn't be net negative for the company? Right? I mean, think about, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody. You clearly would get diminishing marginal returns, but I think that much no one's going to argue with, right? 10x. I mean, let's go crazy. 10x. You clearly get diminishing marginal returns. but. If I gave you 10 times more money, I don't think you would be performing at the level you're performing now. You need constraint. The, someone, I was talking to someone who was, worked for NPR and who was doing a book on the fact that um, Ray Kroc, the guy who was the McDonald's guy, his widow took all of the money left to her by Ray and basically gave almost all of it to NPR. And overnight, NPR got billions of dollars. And she said, you've no idea what a completely toxic effect this had on the culture. This is not a culture that was equipped to deal with cash raining down from the skies, right? <laughs> um, it wasn't positive. Now, maybe it ended up eventually. But you know, it's really hard to, I throw it out there, just, it's really hard to think of cases where, uh, where things don't get, uh, eventually start to go negative um, involving, in things involving humans. One sure. last question. I was wondering uh, how you thought the U-shaped curve might apply to mastery. If it takes 10,000 hours to master something, is there some point past that where you're getting yeah. a negative effect? Yeah, this is an interesting. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, this is a very, so there is a, a, a huge, um, not huge, there's a significant literature on this very question. Um, so if you. And it fits, it does, I think, fit into the U-shaped model. So we don't think, we, we clearly think, so what we're describing with the 10,000 hour rule is the left side of the curve. So 10,000 hours is the point at which, um, for many complex, cognitively complex activities, the point at which the curve starts to flatten out a bit. And we're getting, another way of saying that is past 10,000 hours, um, you get diminished returns from additional practice. But the really interesting question is, is there a right side and the answer is, yeah, I think there's a white right side. So for example, if there isn't sufficient variety and challenge, um, after the point at which mastery, addition, initial mastery is reached, then what do you get? You get boredom. It becomes rote. You know, why do we worry about the performance of you know, surgeons as they get older? Well, because we realize that the, the work isn't necessarily as engrossing as it was when they were younger, and they were still, they still felt they were progressing in some way. So we, you know, 
The oldest surgeon works well when they have managed to contrive for themselves a situation where they continue to have to meet certain kinds of achievable challenges. Um, but it's a real problem. I mean, all of us have run into professionals at the end of their career, and you can say, I think, quite, um, uh, quite reasonably that they have spent too much time um, in their profession, right? They've gone, they're on the right side of the curve. And by the way, this, and I'll end on this note, this brings up an additional really fascinating distinction that I've always thought was incredibly important, which was when you observe, so if you look at any number of complex uh, professions and you look at the productivity curves of people in them, you see something that is broadly U-shaped. So you see improvement over some period at the beginning, then you see a flattening out, and then you see decline at the end. Um, the question is, is that curve a function of age or experience? In other words, is, it, is your performance at the end of your life going down because you're old, or is it simply because you've been doing that thing for too long? And the answer seems to be the latter. In other words, if you take people who are in mid-career and you transfer them into a new domain, they will have an experience roughly similar to that same curve. So it's a very hopeful thing. It says that a lot of times we think what we're seeing is um, age-related decline. We're not. All we're seeing is someone who is, who is just on the backside of an experience curve. And that what we need to do is give them new challenges in a new environment, and we can see the same um, improvement in, in performance. But anyway, thank you all very much. Hope you enjoy my book. <laughs>